Hello students and welcome to chapter number 11. This chapter is titled Organization Design. This is one of the major functions of managers. Remember we said that the major functions of managers were planning, organizing, leading and controlling. So now in this chapter we will be discussing this function of organizing. We will talk about how do managers organize entire organizations or how do they organize work within their own departments and their own functions. So to begin with, we have to uh, distinguish between a number of different terms over here. We start with the term organizing. So we have seen organizing before. It's basically a management function that involves arranging and structuring work to accomplish the organization's goals. So how do managers uh, put together you know pieces and bits in order to accomplish something in order to accomplish a goal in order to achieve a task so how do we and how do managers uh, arrange put together structure and how do they uh, um, basically make efforts uh, coordinated in a in a manner that in, in enables them to achieve those goals and the objectives of their organization and then we have organizational structure. So a, a structure is basically uh, how those uh, jobs are being arranged. It's the formal arrangement of those jobs within an organization. How, based on what did you decide that I am going to create this department? And who is going to be in that department? So that's the structure of your organization. And then you have the organizational chart. So that's basically a visual representation of that structure that you just created. So chart now, hierarchy. So that's a visual representation. structure organization So that it it's it's visible to you right now. It's visual so that it makes sense. And finally we have organizational design. So in here, this is the part where we create or change an organization's structure. This is when we, this is when we uh, uh, decide on the um, on the entire structure of the entire organization, and this is where where we decide, uh, like, how are we going to group certain jobs together? How are we uh, how are we going to create uh, new branches or whatever? So in organizational design. We have a number of elements, uh, particularly six elements, that we must consider if we are uh, engaging in the process of organizational design. We will get to see them in coming slides. So this exhibit tells us about why do we organize? What is the purpose of organizing? So managers, of course, uh, are heavily involved in organizing because uh, organizing helps them divide work to be done in specific jobs and departments. So we have big tasks in organizations. We have to recruit people. We have to gain more market share. So this is not an easy task and, and this big wholesome task is divided into smaller tasks. So this is why we uh, organize. We want to divide these bigger tasks into smaller ones so that we can achieve them. And then uh, one of the purposes is also to assign tasks and responsibilities to individuals. So basically we decide who does what. Khalid, Ahmed, Munira, Hassa, what do they do exactly? What is their uh, uh, contribution to achieving this organizational goal? And then we coordinate diverse organizational tasks. One of the most challenging jobs of a manager is making sure that these different units are working together. Um, so coordinating their efforts and ensuring that all of them eventually contribute to achieving organizational goals. And then one of uh, and the second, the next uh, purpose is clustering jobs into units. So basically in here we are grouping, putting together jobs so that we achieve more productivity and more efficiency. Uh, establishing relationships among individuals, groups, and departments. We must establish that relationship so that 
each and everyone knows to whom do they report, if they have a problem, where do they go, and what is the relationship between this department and that department? How do they support each other? Or do we need another department's approval for us to do something? We also establish lines of authority. This is a, a huge one because, as I mentioned before, you need to know to whom do you report, you need to know who your boss is, you need to know who your uh, who, who works under your supervision so that to whom can you give orders, to whom can you give uh, work tasks and so on. And finally, it's all about allocating and deploying organizational resources. Without a clear structure, there's no uh, clear way of knowing how these resources within the organization are going to be distributed. So things like budgets and assets and even uh, uh, human resources like number of employees, we need to know how can we allocate and how can we uh, put them to, uh, to effective use. Without a structure, these things cannot happen. And now we begin with our six elements of organizational design. The first one over here is work specialization. Another term for it is known uh, as um, division of labor, division of labor, which is basic labor, which is basically uh, dividing work activities into separate job tasks. So you have a big task, uh, let's say recruiting people. Totally so in order to bring someone new into the organization, you have to announce vacancies. orientation. So that's a big task. So now in work specialization or division of labor, you are dividing these work activities into smaller ones, separate ones. So you have a team of people who are only responsible for, let's say, announcing these job vacancies on the company's website, on social media like LinkedIn and Twitter and so on. Then you have another group of people who are only responsible for sourcing those CVs. يفرزون السيفيات فقط يقدمون عليك آلاف الناس فتحتاج أن يكون عندكم موظفين شغلتهم منهم هم يفرزون هذه السيفيات ويشوفون uh, are those people and those CVs are they suitable for these vacancies for these job openings or not and then you have another group of people who are only responsible for doing the assessments the interviews and so on so that's what we mean by work specialization uh, Initially, the goal of work specialization and the division of labor is when you specialize, you become more productive. Instead of having to do something from A to Z, when you specialize in a very sp narrow area, you become better at it and you become more efficient at it. Uh, but we will see in the, in the coming slide how at the, like it, this is true, but only up to a certain point. As this exhibit is showing us, uh, look at the slope over here. It goes up and up and up and up. So the uh, the uh, higher productivity is a is a characteristic of uh, work specialization. The more you specialize, the more productive you become, but only up to a certain point because the human diseconomies factor plays in. What do we mean by this? When, you, when your only job is to do only one thing, then you become bored, you become tired, you become, uh, basically, you, you, you feel that you're not growing anymore, so then your productivity drops. Uh, اسمك أخصائي توظيف في الشركة لكن شغلتك أنك بس تسوي فرز للسيفيات um, Yes, you, you, I mean, when, when you do that for a very long time, you become very good at it تكون أكيد ممتاز جدا وسريع جدا في فرز السيفيات لكن توصل إلى مرحلة خلاص أنت حتوصل إلى مرحلة من الملال مرحلة من أنت تحس أنه I'm, I'm not learning anything anymore I'm not being challenged So your productivity might drop 
So this is what we mean by economies and diseconomies of work. Yes, work specialization and division of labor is supposed to help you become more productive because you specialize in something and you do it very well, but then only up to a certain point and productivity will drop. So the solution to this is that you have to, you know, change uh, work tasks and rotate people from uh, one section to another. التدوير الوظيفي هذا يسموه أحيانا اللي هو يغيرون المهام حقة الواحد ما بين فترة للثانية. It happens in Aramco, it happens in Sabak, in so many other places where they rotate people across different sections. إحنا أنت لسه ما زلت في إدارة التوظيف بس سلناك من المهمة هذه وعطيناك المهمة الجديدة هذه. بعد سنة سنة سنتين ستة شهور حنغيرك ندورك نسوي تدوير rotation we move you from one section to another. So that's work specialization or division of labor. And the second element in organizational design is departmentalization. So basically creating departments or grouping jobs together. So based on what did I decide I'm going to create this department and which jobs am I going to include in this department? We have a number of different ways, particularly five ways, common ways of departmentalization. Uh, of course, there are so many other ways um, that companies have followed. مش معنى هذا إنه خلاص نحنا لازم الشركة تكون واحدة من الخمسة هذول لا في شركات كثير صنعت أو يعني جاءت بطرق جديدة للdepartmentalization. We just have to uh, go through these five different ways uh, so that it, it it'll make things a lot more clear on why these certain jobs were put together in one unit or in one department. So here we have those five common forms of departmentalization. The first one over here is functional, the functional departmentalization. The most common one is that we create departments based on functions, let's say based on specialization. So you have one department for engineering, another department for accounting, another department for human resources, and so on. So what is the purpose of putting jobs together? We want to know like who is doing what. We want to know which units are responsible for which part of the organizational objectives and tasks and so on. And then through this we will understand like how do these how do these departments, how do these groups of jobs, how do they support each other, how do they uh, contribute to each other's success and so on. So that's the first and most common one is the function, the functional departmentalization. Basically you have functions, so you have specializations, you have a group of people who are from this similar backgrounds and they all do uh, uh, similar jobs. So you have accountants, you have human resources people, you have engineers and so on. The second one is the geographical departmentalization. So based on the geographic location. بناءً على المنطقة. بناءً على المنطقة. أحياناً بعض الشركات تحصل فيها زي أرامكو زي كثير شركات ثانية وكالات السيارات أحياناً تحصل فيها تقسيمة الشركة جاية بناءً على المناطق. هذه مبيعات المنطقة الغربية وهذا قسم مبيعات المنطقة الشرقية وهذا قسم مبيعات المنطقة الوسطى and so on. This is uh, this is actually very helpful for such organizations that that have a narrow specialization and that are spread across a huge geographic location. فلما نتكلم مثلاً عن وكالة سيارات هي ما يسوون إلا هي هي هذه الشغلة فقط هم يبيعون سيارات ويسووا لها سيارة فقط. فبالتالي it makes sense for them that they, you know, organize their um, uh, uh, their uh, their organization in this way across geographical locations. Um, كذلك في الشركات اللي مثلا uh, huge على مستوى العالم تحصل يقول لك هذه مبيعات المنطقة في الشرق الأوسط هذه مبيعات أوروبا هذه مبيعات أمريكا الشمالية and so on. So this is very uh, helpful and it makes sense when the organization is spread across a huge geographical area and they when they specialize in like a very limited number of uh, products or services that they are offering 
The third way or the third form of departmentalization is based on products. Is based on products. لما تحصل مصنع من مصانع الأغذية مثلا زي شركة بيبسي زي شركة مصنع ديمة حق الحلويات مثلا تحصل عندهم الأقسام والإدارات بناء على المنتجات تحصل هذا إدارة أو قسم المعمول وهذا قسم البسكويت وهذا قسم الشوكولاتة وغيره okay so it, it makes sense when you are offering a lot of different products and uh, these uh, uh, products are uh, they have their own budgets, they have their own uh, plans, they have their own teams, their own specialists. So uh, this is uh, another way of doing departmentalization, when grouping jobs together based on the products that these people are uh, uh, engaging at. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, one of the most common ways actually in a lot of different companies uh, you have, uh, زي ما ذكرنا مصانع الحلويات أحيانا مصانع الأغذية uh, كثير كذلك من مصانع أحيانا petrochemicals يسوون نفس الشيء هذه الأقسام اللي تنتج مادة كذا وهذه الأقسام اللي شغالة على المادة الفلانية and so on and the final two forms we have process departmentalization so basically, we are grouping things together based on the processes on which they work. غالبا هنا لما يكون عندنا منت يعني منتجات محدودة جدا منتج واحد خلينا نقول منتج واحد مثلا. Okay. So uh, this is when we divide work and when we group group jobs together based on the process, based on the task, in order to achieve that and uh, that task and in order to complete that finished product. تحصل عندك الأقسام كالتالي هذا قسم أو الإدارة المسؤولة عن الخياطة هذا القسم أو الإدارة المسؤولة عن التجميع هذا القسم أو الإدارة المسؤولة عن التلميع عن سوان تحصل مصنع سيارات مثلا قسم وإدارة كاملة مسؤولة عن التنجيد وكذا قسم وإدارة كاملة مسؤولة عن الشغلات الميكانيكال قسم وإدارة كاملة مسؤولة عن الأمور الأخرى so basically when you are dividing jobs and dividing uh, and putting together uh, groups of jobs based on the processes that the, the the idea here is that is efficiency the idea here is efficiency if, if we even go back to history we have uh, Frederick uh, Taylor this is this was one of the uh, uh, leaders uh, and scholars of um, uh, management and he came up with scientific management where he said that we need to divide uh, bigger tasks into smaller ones so that we understand where we are wasting time and energy and, and, and you know, resources. So that's a, a, a representation of scientific management. And the final way, the fifth way, is customer departmentalization. So this is when you divide uh, and you group jobs together based on the customers you serve. إدارة أو قسم للمبيعات زي شركات التأمين مثلا شركات التأمين يقول لك هذه مبيعات القطاع الحكومي هذه مبيعات القطاع الخاص هذه مبيعات الأفراد تحصلها أحيانا كذلك في البنوك في أقسام التمويل يقول لك هذا التمويل الخاص بأصحاب المشاريع هذا التمويل الخاص بالأفراد هذا التمويل الخاص بالقطاع العام أو القطاع الخاص and so on so like you have a number of different ways in order to design and uh, the departments within your organization. You have to consider a number of different factors. Uh, you have to decide which one of these forms uh, achieves the most efficiency and makes most sense to your special organization, your special circumstances, the nature of your products and services, whether or not you are spread across a huge geographical location, and so on. So departmentalization is all about grouping jobs together in order for you to achieve more efficiency and become more productive. Since we are talking about departmentalization, one of the major trends nowadays uh, in today's work environment is, you know, team teams and uh, team working. And uh, one of the skills that are required now by most organizations is that they want someone who's a good team player. But um, uh, um, uh, 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 and a distinguished one here is cross-functional teams. 
So cross-functional teams. So these are teams that are, uh, you know, comprised and composed of individuals from different functions. So imagine this scenario. You have a product launch team. Uh, you create a team in order to launch a new product in your company. أشخاص من إدارات مختلفة cross functions رح يكون عندك ناس من الماركتينج of course رح يكون عندك ناس كذلك من الإنجينيرينج because you want those engineers to tell you about the technical specifications uh, of your product so that you can design those work uh, those uh, advertising campaigns you want also someone from public relations علاقات العامة والإعلام اللي راح ينسقون لك شغلات هذه so cross functional teams are a major trend and they it's all about you know putting together people from different functions the whole purpose here is that we want to benefit from these diverse uh, uh, backgrounds so that you can come up with the best output possible and now with the uh, third uh, element in organizational design and that is chain of command so when we talk about chain of command, we talk about authority. We talk about the line of authority extending from upper levels to lower levels. So what is the purpose of this? We want to know who reports to whom. We want to know, I want to know, as an employee, if I have a problem, who is my boss? To whom do I go? I want to know who is the response, who is the leader of this organization? Who is my boss's boss? Uh, and uh, who is his boss? So that's the chain of command for you. It's a line of authority. We want to know from top to bottom who reports to whom. If you are a manager, you have to know if you are a manager. You can tell who you are. If you are an employee, you don't have people under your supervision. Okay, who is the manager? I'll come back to who I have a problem. So that's the whole point of chain of command. So organizational structure shows you this. Shows you and decides the chain of command. So here is what we mean about authority. So it's the line extending from upper organizational levels to the lowest levels. It basically reports uh, and shows reporting relationships. So who is the boss of whom? If you have a problem, to whom do you go? Uh, what is the extent of your um, power over other people? You know, you have subordinates and you have superiors. You have those whom you supervise and that is subordinates and then you have those to whom you report and those are your superiors your bosses so this is what authority means it's 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 all about reporting relationships there are two uh, distinct types of authority and that is line authority and staff authority so when we talk about line authority it's very obvious very clear very straightforward it gives you, the manager, it gives you the power to and the authority to direct the work of an employee. It gives you the power to give someone else orders, to give them commands, to give them, you know, things that they must do. You basically direct their work and uh, uh, their activities in general. But when we talk about staff authority, this is a little bit more subtle, a little bit more different because in line authority it's it's really just that, it's a line. So the human resources manager is your boss and you are the human resources specialist. You report to that manager. But when we talk about staff authority, you there are no reporting relationships. You have to go back to that person because he has the capacity to make some decisions. Uh, so if you look at the definition, positions within with some authority that have been created to support, assist, and advise. Support, assist, and advise those holding line authority. So it's not about giving commands. You cannot actually give them commands. So let's talk about this. Uh, let's give an example. Mudir al-Muwarid al-Bashariya. في زيو مدير مثلا إدارة المشتريات مدير إدارة المشتريات هذا the purchasing manager let's call him uh, this is the person who is in charge of making any decisions when it comes to buying anything in the company يعني تبغى تشتري سيستم لازم مدير إدارة المشتريات هذا هو اللي يوافق على الموضوع هو مش رئيس 
مش رئيس مدير إدارة الموارد البشرية هم في نفس الليفل في, في الأورجانيزيشنال ستراكشر لكن مدير المشتريات هذا الـ Purchasing Manager is the one who is responsible who has the authority to make those decisions when it comes to buying anything for example in the organization فمدير الموارد البشرية يبغى يشري أثاث للمكتب يبغى يجيب سيستم جديد عشان فرز السيفيز يبغى يسوي أي حاجة لها علاقة بالشراء لازم إنه هو يرجع لمدير المشتريات هذا على أساس يعطي له السبورت والأسستنس والأدفايس in order to make that decision. So that's your line authority and your staff authority. In line authority, you have the direct power to give orders to someone else. In staff authority, it's more of a supportive assistance and advisory role. Okay, since we are still talking about chain of command, we just talked about authority. Let's talk a little about responsibility. So responsibility is the obligation or expectation to perform any assigned duties. Uh, you have certain responsibilities as a manager, you have certain responsibilities as a leader, you have certain responsibilities as a regular employee. كل شخص عنده مسؤوليات, عنده التزامات, obligations and responsibilities. Basically, you are expected to do something. You are expected in within that role of yours, within that capacity and that authority of yours to do something. The manager متوقع منه إن هو يسوي بعض الأمور. إن هو لازم يكون عادل في التعامل مع موظفينه. إن هو لازم يوزع العمل بطريقة يعني عادلة وأخلاقية. إن هو يقيم الموظفين بشكل جيد. إن هو يتخذ قرارات في مصلحة الشركة. So that is your though this is an example of responsibility. There is an obligation. You have to. You, ha you are expected to do that because we gave you that role. And then uh, within that same concept, we have unity of command. So these are the management principle that this is the management principle that teach uh, that uh, uh, that basically says that each person should report to only one manager. Of course, this is a this is this is very um, important because when you have different people to whom you report, this is when things get lost. And this is when, every, when there's confusion and ambiguity about you, you know, ex expectations from you. أحياناً تحصل في بعض الشركات إنه يكون عندك أكثر من مدير. واحد يقول لي مستحيل يا أخي كيف يصير عندي أكثر من مدير. It does happen. I do remember an example where in a certain project, in a certain project, I had to give uh, you know, always reports to two different managers, the manager of finance and the manager of public relations. كان في مهمة مشروع معين اللي هو الاجتماع العام للمساهمين حقين الشركة. هنا سووا اللي هو cross functional team. وجابوا ناس من العلاقات العامة وجابوا ناس من الإدارة المالية لأنه إحنا نتكلم على مساهمين وفلوس وأسهم وكذا فلازم في ناس من المالية لازم في ناس من العلاقات العامة لأنه هذول الناس اللي مسؤولين عن أي شيء له يعني علاقة خارجية. وجابوا ناس كذلك من أماكن أخرى فـ I the manager of finance and the manager of public relations they both demanded different things they both wanted me to do different things so I had to give some information to both of them and sometimes their orders their um, directions were contradictory uh, meaning that أحيانا يعطوني الاثنين هذولا تعليمات فيها تناقض شوية ف it, 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 it posed an issue for me. I, I was a little confused. I didn't know whom I should satisfy. I didn't exactly know what to do in that situation. So this is what we mean by unity of command. Each person, each employee must report only to one other person, only to one other manager. Otherwise, things will get, will get a little bit confusing and ambiguous. And now with the fourth element in organizational design, and that is span of control. So what we mean by span of control is how many people do you control? How many people can each manager effectively manage? So how many subordinates do you have as a manager? How many people are there under your supervision? But it's not just the number. It's We, we are trying to come up with the best figure in terms of like how how many people exactly can you effectively manage? إيش هو العدد الأمثل اللي يخليك إن أنت ممكن تديرهم بطريقة كويسة? So that is what we mean by span of control. 
uh, we don't have a rule of thumb uh, when it comes to that ما عندنا قاعدة كذا معينة تقول لنا أفضل عدد للإداء أنك من المرؤوسين هو كذا we do not have that and when it comes to organizational practices uh, companies have are very different in terms of that في بعض الشركات تحصل مدير تحته شخصين فقط في بعض الشركات مدير تحته مئات الأشخاص so it, it differs from one company to another we do not have a rule of thumb in terms of that but we we are we always say like look for effectiveness can you really manage 50 people effectively or not and sometimes it depends on the manager him, him or herself بعض المدراء عندهم القدرة انه ممكن يدير 50 شخص بطريقة احترافية جدا وبعض الناس حتى خمسة أشخاص مو قادر يديرهم so it, it could differ from one person to another it's an ability it's a it's kind of a skill so in this exhibit there's just a small um, let's say comparison between two different organizations uh, with one organization having a wider span of control uh, basically what this exhibit is trying to show us is that the the organization that has a wider span span of control meaning the organization that have you know more people reporting to one manager it has fewer levels and it has a, f a fewer number of managers as well الشركة اللي عندها عدد أكبر من المرؤوسين للمدير الواحد الليفلز فيها تكون أقل وكذلك عدد المدراء يكون فيها أقل uh, it's, 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 This is just something for organizations to think about uh, that, like this is, is this something that works for your organization or not? Is this something that you are looking for? Do you want lower levels? Do you want a fewer number of managers or not? This is just, you know, one of the factors that you must consider when deciding on the span of control. And the fifth element in organizational design, and that is centralization and decentralization. دائماً تحصلون المصطلح هذا في اللغة العربية بالنسبة لمواد الإدارة اللي هو المركزية. Centralization or العكس لا مركزية or decentralization. So that is the degree to which decision making is concentrated, is centralized at upper levels of the organization. وعكسها طبعا decentralization. It's the degree to which lower level employees provide input or actually make decisions. So when we talk about centralization, we are basically saying that only uh, upper level management and fewer People in upper level management have the authority and the capacity to make decisions in the company. أحيانا تحصلها القرارات كلها ترجع لشخص واحد فقط. يعني أتكلم يعني كل القرارات كبيرة وصغيرة. يعني هو في النهاية يقولك طب كل القرارات لازم يوافق عليها مثلا مدير الشركة أو رئيس الشركة أو CEO or whatever. This is correct. لكن we are talking about each and every even little decision. يعني أنت تخيل شركة بحجم شركة أرامكو مثلا فيها أكثر من عشرة آلاف موظف. حتى لما تبغى توظف يعني شخص يعتبر من اللور ليفل مثلا مشغل في المصنع لازم السي اي او حق ارامكو يوافق عليه هذا ذيس از جاست ان اكزامبل اتس نوت اكشلي وات از هابنينج انت تخيل اذا يعني السي اي او حق ارامكو هذا راح يسوي ايش ولا ايش بالله حينتبه للسوق النفط العالمي ولا حينتبه لي التوظيف ولا حينتبه للميزانيات so this is what we mean by centralization is that each and every decision small or big is being centralized mean, meaning it that only a few people in upper level management have the authority and the capacity to make those decisions or decentralization this is when lower level uh, employees have either at least you know some input some voice in decision making can influence decision making or they actually have the capacity to make those decisions معناها انه حتى الناس اللي في positions ما تعتبر قيادية او غيره they have at least some authority to make those to make some of those decisions so again we cannot say that yes decentralization is the best way to go or centralization is very bad don't do it we have to consider a number of different factors we have to consider you know, the circumstances of individual organizations and so on. And this is what I mean. So, in 
certain environments and certain uh, uh, circumstances, you might require a little bit even more centralization. But in other environments, opposite to that, you like centralization would not work. Centralization would actually hinder progress. You must move t towards more decentralization. Let's you know take a couple of examples. So when we when the environment is stable, it's not you know characterized by a lot of change. Centralization could work, meaning uh, when you, you know we have taken stability strategy before. We we when we say stability, we mean there isn't a lot of change. So when things are stable, they're not moving. You know, nothing is too com complex. So it means that you know one person or a few people can make those decisions without any issues. But when the environment is complex and uncertain and is characterized by a lot of change, you do need the expertise of more than one person, that's for sure, but you also need decision making to be very quick and responsive. But when you have decision making for each person, you lose that uh, you know, uh, uh, swift responsiveness when it comes to decision making. It takes a lot of time. Uh, let's take another example. So when uh, decisions are relatively uh, minor, you could go with more centralization. It could be in the hands of a fewer people. But when the decisions are very significant and actually can be milestones for the history in the, of the company, then you definitely need to move towards more decentralization because you have to get the you know input from multiple angles you have to uh, you have to have the points of view from uh, different levels even in the organization to really understand the situation and as such uh, when the company is large uh, then Yes, centralization could actually work, but when the company is geographically dispersed, meaning then you cannot go with centralization. This is going to take a lot of time. And sometimes the CEO in the U.S. does not really understand the market in India. So you probably uh, are better off taking that or making that decision by someone who is a little bit more local. So this is an exhibit that illustrates when centralization could be beneficial actually and when could it be efficient. And on the other hand, when uh, decentralization could be the answer. And since we are talking about um, span of control and you know power and authority, we must talk a little bit about the concept of employee empowerment. When you empower someone, you give them the power. So when, you, when we talk about employee empowerment, we mean that you give your employees the power, the authority, the capacity to make some decisions. Or at least you give them, they say, a voice in decision making. You at least listen to them before you make a decision that is probably going to affect them, affect their work and their livelihood maybe. So uh, this is why you know more and more organizations are moving towards empowering their employees. Uh, they now, some organizations are trying to come up with mechanisms and ways of, you know, Involving their employees in making decisions. قبل لا يتخذ قرار كبير في الشركة يسوون استبيان للموظفين يسألوهم أنتوا إيش رأيكم أنتوا إيش اقتراحاتكم. And uh, the, uh, at some organizations they have even taken that a step forward by giving lower level employees the actual power of making the decision without having to come back and you know uh, taking permission from their managers. Uh, مثلا في بعض الشركات يقول لك إحنا شركة محتاجين نوظف ناس بسرعة فبدل ما أطلب منك أنت يا أخصائي التوظيف أنه في كل مرة لازم ترجع وتأخذ موافقة المدير خلاص أنا أنت معاك إلى ليفل معين you can make the decision yourself أنا أتذكر في أحد الشركات هنا في الجبال قالوا لأخصائي التوظيف معاك ميزان إلى 
اذا تبغى توظف احد معك الى راتب 27000 تقدر توظف الشخص هذا وتعطيه تعرض عليه عرض وظيفي من غير ما ترجع لمديرك وي تراست يو اكثر من 27000 اوكي الحين ممكن لازم تضطر ترجع انه انت تاخذ موافقه مديرك المباشر سو ذس واي ذي ميد ذير امبلويز مور بروداكتيف they send send them a message that we trust you uh, when it comes to making decisions and we are empowering you we are giving you some power in order to make those decisions so it it does create um, a positive environment where the employees would feel more trusted would feel that they are actually involved that their managers listen to them and that any decision that is going to be made It, it at least has their input. So this is why employee empowerment has become more of a trend in today's work environment. And now we have reached the sixth and final element of organizational design, and that is formalization. As you can see, there's the word formal in there, meaning it has to do with rules and regulations and standardization of jobs. So in highly formalized structures, you will have uh, a very tight, a very clear job description that you cannot go beyond. And people probably have little discretion or freedom or autonomy to behave. Uh, and everything they do must be according to rules and regulations. In less formalized organizations it's exactly the opposite meaning the you know structure is a little bit more loose authority is not very much emphasized and uh, rules and regulations are more like guidelines rather than you know governing principles of how things should happen in an organization now does that mean that one is correct and the other is wrong this is never ever the case in management Everything has its own pros and cons. Each and everything can work in certain situations and not necessarily work in others. So these are just all the options available for managers. So they can choose to make their structures highly formalized and emphasizing authority, emphasizing rules and regulations, or they can go with the other option of being more flexible and um, you know, adopting uh, a structure and a design that emphasizes people's freedom and autonomy to behave in certain ways. So following that um, distinction between highly formalized and less formalized uh, organizational designs, we have these distinctions of uh, mechanistic organizations versus organic organizations. So in mechanistic, comes from mechanics, comes from, you know, machinery. It's, it's all about the rules, it's all about the regulations, it's all about, you know, tight controls and rigidity. So everything has to be uh, uh, according to a rule or a regulation. Everyone has highly specialized jobs. Authority, authority is highly emphasized. The distance between upper management and lower level employees, specifically field employees, is very high. So the structure is actually very tall. And because of this, uh, because these, you know, high level bosses cannot directly view the performance of lower level people, they have uh, created additional positions of supervisors, managers, section heads, department heads, and so on, so that they can Uh, you know, they can make sure that everything is going according to the rules and the regulations. So everyone has highly specialized jobs that they cannot go beyond. On the other hand, you have these organic organizations where everything is characterized by, you know, flexibility, by being more adaptive. It's all about responding to change. So yes, there are division of There is division of labor, like people have, you know, certain roles that they are in charge of, but they handle diff like diverse problems, unlike mechanistic organizations. تحصل في mechanistic organizations خلاص شخص واحد الشخص الفلاني مسؤول عن جزئية ضيقة معينة جدا من عملية التوظيف أو من عملية حساب الميزانية. 
ما يطلع عنها نهائيا لانه هذا الوصف الوظيفي حقه يقول له انت ما تطلع عن كذا هذا مو من صلاحياتك انك تسويه لكن الاورجانيك اورجانيزيشنز ما في جاب ديسكربشنز بالدقه هذه فبالتالي الناس يتعاملون مع مهام مختلفه ويشوفون اشياء متنوعه في خير من من خلال عملهم so that is sort of the difference i hope this makes it now a little bit more clear where you have highly formalized mechanistic organizations it's like a machine it has to go by the rules and regulations وحسابات دقيقه جدا unlike organic organizations where it's uh, it has to do with the uh, adaptive uh, being adaptive it has to do with being flexible so that you can respond to change and uh, it's all about uh, you know people not being highly supervised but given the trust uh, and to behave in the best interest of their departments units and the organization as a whole and here's a nice exhibit that summarizes what we have just discussed the differences between mechanistic and organic organizations as we as we have just seen in mechanistic organizations it's highly specialized where in organic organizations it's all about cross cross functional teams basically you handle different problems of diverse natures it's uh, in mechanistic organizations it, it is uh, very rigid but in organic it's all about again cross hierarchical teams it has a, in, in mechanistic organizations it's all about authority it's all about chain of command where in organic it's a free flow of information like it's highly acceptable and even encouraged to go and talk to your boss's boss to go to another department but in mechanistic organizations ما تقدر حتى تتواصل مع اداره ثانيه الا من خلال السوبرفايزر تبعك والسوبرفايزر لازم يرفع للمدير والمدير يرفع للمدير العام وبعدين يعني so it's all about the chain of command التراتبيه هذه مثل العسكريه it's, it, everyone has a distinct role that they must absolutely stick to so here are different options of you know mechanistic versus organic highly formalized versus less formalized so an interesting idea here is the link between strategy and structure طبيعي جدا انه ذكرنا في البداية المحاضرة انه structure is based on a lot of things we go back and you know we examine our organization we examine our mission vision and all these things the same thing happens with strategy so everything has to do with how this is strategy how do you want to grow your business and how do you want to make money so it's only logical that you choose a structure that supports your strategy so if your strategy has to do with lots of flexibility has to do with you know being rapidly responsive to change then you probably would go with a with an organic structure with a less formalized design but if your strategy is all about you know cost reduction and be tightly controlling you know production costs and other things like that then you pro it's probably a better idea to go with highly formalized mechanistic uh, design because this supports the way you want to make money so the link between strategy and structure even though it seems very logical but you would be surprised by how many organizations simply forget to choose or to design their organizations in a way that is actually supportive of their business model or their business strategy Another interesting thing that you must pay attention to when you know working on the structure and the design of, of an organization is the link to its size. So how big is the organization uh, and how is that size going to influence the structure that you should choose? Um, we there's as as per the note here there's considerable evidence that an organization size affects its structure 
we basically noticed that in large organizations, and when we say large organizations, we talk about you know roughly more than 2,000 empl employees. In large organizations, things tend to be highly specialized and it's a little bit more mechanistic. But in smaller organizations, especially startups, العمال الناشئة هذه تكون دائما الأمور فيها نوع من اللخبطة صحيح وتكون الشخص الواحد مسؤول عن أكثر من حاجة خصوصا في الأعمال الناشئة تحصل شركة صغيرة جدا فيها يعني 300 شخص أو أقل بعض الشركات فيها أقل من ذلك بكثير فيها 10 أشخاص 7 أشخاص زي اللي بدأوا تطبيقات مثلا تحصل الشخص الواحد هو يسوي اتش ار ويسوي ماركتنج ويسوي فاينانس ويسوي اكاونتنج ويسوي ميزانيات ويسوي كل شيء. So it definitely the size has a lot of influence but but once an organization grows past a certain size size has less influence. What does that mean? لما تكبر الشركة إلى حد معين مهما كبرت بعد هذه النقطة خلاص الحجم ما عاد يأثر يعني شركة وصل عدد موظفينها إلى ثلاثة ألاف طبيعي جدا أنه ثلاثة ألاف شخص هذولا لازم كل واحد فيهم له دور معين له وظيفة كذا لها نطاق معين بصلاحيات معينة ما يقدر يطلع عنه لأنه مستحيل أنه ثلاثة ألاف شخص كل واحد فيهم قاعد يعني خلينا نقول يقط مع الشخص الثاني في وظيفته everything has to be very you know clear there are clear boundaries of each and everyone's responsibilities Uh, فبالتالي بعد الثلاثة آلاف مثلا خلاص مهما زودت عدد الموظفين ما عاد يفرق ما عاد يفرق العدد هذا ما عاد يأثر على الستراكشر أو التركيبة أو الهيكلة حقت الشركة. So the more the size grows past a certain uh, you know number cut off point then the, the influence of the size on the structure becomes less. Okay? So at the beginning yes you have to consider that The size of your organization, the number of people working in this company has to do, uh, has to be factored in the decision when it comes to choosing what sort of structure works better. But up to a certain point, then the size basically has less and less influence. And here's another uh, element also that must be considered when it comes to structure, and that is, of course, technology. Technology has a major role in all organizational decisions and of course the same applies when it comes to design and structure. So um, depending on the size of the company, depending on the technology of the company, depending on whatever uh, you know means of production they have, uh, different organizations um, measure their production differently. So there are certain organizations that have technologies that allows them to uh, measure their production in terms of units. So in small batches, did you share it? Tell us, how do we measure the production? We produce 500 cases in a day, or in a hour, or in a month. So this is unit production, smaller batches. It's about the number of units, the number of items. لكن in mass production اللي بالجملة بال, بالكميات كبيرة جدا so in these companies they would tell you that we measure our production in terms of larger batches so هنا يقول لك احنا نقيس الانتاجية حقتنا احنا مو ننتج زي اللي قبلنا 500 كيس في اليوم احنا ننتج 500 كرتون في الساعة 500 كرتون من الاكياس في الساعة احنا ننتج 300 طن من الكذا انتاج كبير جدا عندهم mass production and then you have process production where they measure you know items of their production in terms of continuous processes so in here this is a, this is a lot different from the previous two because it has to do with the process that they uh, employ in their uh, plants and manufacturing uh, facilities to produce these items. So of course the technology has a lot to do when it comes to uh, you know production and based on that this is it is probably a good idea to consider this when it comes to choosing 
what structure works better in this light of uh, production اي وحده من designs حقت organization ممكن تكون more supportive of either unit production, mass production or process production so this nice exhibit shows us why you should like what sort of structure works better with which type of uh, technology so if you're a smaller organization uh, that, and you, your production is relatively small and you measure your production in terms of units then it's probably a better idea to go with an organic structure why because you need less formalization you have low vertical and horizontal differentiation we have seen those in the previous chapter what did we mean by differentiation you know horizontal backward and forward and so on so because of such characteristics it's probably a better idea to go with an organic structure because this will be supportive of your production it would be more effective this way but in mass production control اكثر غالبا تحتاج سوبرفايزرز اكثر يشرفون على الانتاج يشرفون على المصانع يشرفون على كل العمليات اللي تصير عندك في الشركه حتى في الاتش ار حتى في الفاينانس اند سو ان ان اوردر تو انشور ذات اول يو نو يور برودكشن بروسيسز ار جوينج ويل نوت ذا سيم ابلايز فور بروسيس برودكشن اذا العمليات الانتاج عندك تعتمد على البروسيس نفسها تعتمد على الاوبريشن نفسها ما لها علاقه ب يعني ما ما لها علاقة بالكمية ولكن لها علاقة بالكيفية. Okay? Then it's again probably a better idea to go with an organic structure because you would need less formalization. It is characterized by high vertical differentiation but low horizontal differentiation. Okay? So ما عندك um, تنوع كثير horizontally تذكرون لما تكلمنا horizontally so it's all about the competition so ما عندك merger مثلا but it has to do with you know high vertical differentiation meaning uh, you know that you are trying to offer something that is a bit more unique and this is why you are focusing more on the process so you would need an organic structure so that there's free flow of information uh, and الناس اللي عندك uh, highly uh, you know professional they can communicate with one another easily without having you know to pay much attention to you know layers and ranks within the organization so as we have mentioned before ما نقدر نقول organic أحسن ولا mechanistic أحسن ولا highly formalized أحسن it has to do with your own company الظروف circumstances within your own organization everything has its own advantages and disadvantages and once again, another factor to consider when it comes to structure, something that will probably affect your structure, is the uh, factor of environmental uncertainty. We have seen uncertainty before. We have seen how that affects managerial decisions. So, of course, it would also have something to do when it comes to choosing and deciding on your structure and design. Uh, there are certain businesses that operate in relatively stable environments and others that operate in highly changing environments that are characterized by lots of changes lots of uh, you know unexpected things so which structure works better with which situation in stable simple environments it's probably a good idea to go with a mechanistic design this kind of design and structure could be more effective uh, because you know you don't have to respond to change you do not have to you know change lots of things within your organization to respond to these different situations in the market so everything is tightly controlled and everything is relatively clear but in other environments where things are changing rapidly and it's characterized by lots of uncertainty then you would probably go with an organic design because you need that flexibility to respond to these changes quickly uh, and this is why lots of organizations have changed and restructured their um, their designs in order to be high more responsive 
to such situations in the market. Um, so uncertainty, will, and, and the degree of uncertainty definitely should impact the decision that you make regarding your structure and design. Organic or mechanistic, highly formalized, less formalized, you should consider the environmental uncertainty. Do you need to respond to situations very quickly or is everything characterized by you know, stability and not many changes? And here are some of the options available in terms of traditional organizational designs. So we have simple, functional, and divisional structures. In a simple structure, we have little departmentalization, a wide span of control, and high centralization of authority. So in, we, in here, a good example would be like startup companies. Um, تحصل عندك رئيس الشركة تحت واحد مثلا يسميه رئيس الشؤون الإدارية والمالية فهذا الشخص مسؤول عن الاتش ار ومسؤول عن الفاينانس ومسؤول عن الاكاونتنج يمكن حتى مسؤول عن التسويق وشخص ثاني اللي هو مسؤول الشؤون الفنية مثلا فهذا المسؤول عن المصنع مسؤول عن الانتاج مسؤول عن كل الشغلات الثانية اللي لها علاقة بال... بال... بالانتاج المواد اللي هم يبيعوها so very simple uh, typically found in, in um, entrepreneurial uh, startup projects. But in a functional structure, it's about grouping similar jobs and occupations together. So in here, you would find the department of HR, then the department of marketing, the department of finance, and so on. Okay? And then in the divisional structure, in here, this is a little bit bigger. It's about... Um, Separate and semi-autonomous. When we say autonomous, it's about freedom. So semi-autonomous, they have some freedom. Uh, uh, and so these are separate units. زي ما الهيئة الملكية عندنا مثلا. الهيئة الملكية مقسمة إلى divisions أو قطاعات. عندنا قطاع التعليم اللي إحنا نتبع له في كليتنا. عندنا قطاع الاستثمار. عندنا قطاع كذا. قطاع ال ال قطاع الخدمات قطاع الموارد البشرية إلى آخره. So in, in these units are they work separate from each other um, and some of them they uh, they have some sort of, remember in staff authority if you remember so some of them they offer services or advice to other units or to other divisions. Okay. يعني مثلا حقي قطاع التعليم في الهيئة ما يقدر يوظف أشخاص عنده إلا لازم قطاع الموارد البشرية يدعمه. Okay, so this is what we mean by divisions. Um, they they operate separately, uh, individual and separately from one another. They have a little bit more control and freedom over their own activities. رئيس القطاع هذا أو مدير عام القطاع or whatever uh, عنده صلاحية أكبر على القطاع حقه بحيث إنه ممكن يتخذ decisions. So simple structures in smaller organizations, typically in startups, uh, lots of uh, control. عادة الكنترول يكون عن شخص واحد أو أشخاص قليلين جدا. Functional structures. It's all about you know bringing together uh, similar groups and similar specializations. In divisional structures, here we have separate units with uh, a bit more control within their own units. As always, we never say that certain option is the best way to go. Each and every one has its own strengths and weaknesses. And this exhibit shows us some of those strengths and weaknesses for each and every uh, design or structure. So a simple structure, it does have some sort of flexibility. It's inexpensive to maintain. Uh, and it has clear accountability. It shows who is responsible for what. And if something goes wrong, to whom do we go? Some of the weaknesses of a simple structure is that it's not appropriate as the organization grows. When you grow a company, it's very difficult to take control of a person. It's very difficult to take control of a company or an organization that is responsible for more than one field and more than one important field. And then you have those functional structures. Some of the benefits, some of the strengths is cost saving. 
كل شخص خلاص عنده تخصص معين واتحدت هذه الجهود in order to you know benefit the organization as a whole but some of the weaknesses is that uh, it sometimes makes people um, lose sight of what's going on يصير الموارد البشريه شغاله في جهه والتسويق شغال في جهه والاداره الماليه شغاله في جهه sometimes you lose that coordination and that's that's a big problem because at the end we want to serve the organization's benefit the, we want to do what is in the best interest of the company but because of that division because of that uh, function uh, design in that way sometimes you know the coordination becomes a problem and people lose sight of what's going on and finally the divisional structure some of the benefits is that it's it, it focuses on results it, it's it's all about delivering you know what has been promised but some of the weaknesses is that there's duplication of activities تحصل قطاع التعليم قاعد يسوي شيء وقطاع الموارد البشرية قاعد يسوي نفس الشيء احنا كلنا قاعدين نسوي تخطيط استراتيجي so at the end we are just basically doing the same thing twice so the, some, this is one of the problems of divisions طبعا في شركات سوت الديفيجن بشكل مختلف وسوته بشكل أفضل We are just saying that these are some of the typical problems of these structures طيب إذا تكلمنا على ال traditional structures uh, and now we will start talking about some of the more contemporary some of the more modern structures the first one we have is a team structure where basically organizations are made up of teams made up of teams so we don't have like departments and we don't have uh, you know official lines of authority but it's all about work teams so it must be characterized by lots of employee empowerment it has uh, lots of autonomy and it also has lots of accountability power to make decisions also comes accountability مجرد ان انا اعطيك الصلاحيه لاتخاذ القرار هذا برضو يعطيك انت المسؤوليه you know, everything will come will come back to you if you make a mistake if you make a, if there's a problem then you are the one who will be questioned you are the one who is responsible so this is one way that some new organizations are organizing their their structures within their companies and this is how they are designing their um, hierarchies it's all about teams they have created work teams that are responsible for different things so within that concept of team structures we have matrix and project structures these are again more modern more contemporary ways of designing organizations so the matrix structure it's all about you know assigning specialists from different functions to work on a on a on a on a certain project so in here as we will see in the next slide you in here you will have two managers two managers but in these modern ways of doing things you are going to have two managers you're going to have your project manager and you are going to have your functional manager things will be more clear when we get to the next slide in a what is a matrix so it's the you know it's where you have lots of um, you have lots of functions in the company and the HR and the marketing and the but then you have certain projects or certain even products so projects or products that you are working on that has the team واحد من الاتش ار واحد من الماركتينج واحد من المصنع واحد من الانفورميشن سيستم واحد من البرمجه شغالين على البرودكت الاول بعدين تيم ثاني برضو واحد من الاتش ار واحد من الماركتينج واحد من كذا شغالين على المنتج الثاني او المشروع الثاني وهكذا so this this is this is a matrix so it's you know a combination of different things and then similarly you have also project structures where everything is designed around projects the difference between matrix and projects is that in matrix, uh, in a matrix structure, these projects or these products are standing; they are permanent. Okay. So the product the first or the project the second, this is what you're working on. Meaning, most of your time. 
او طول طول فتره وجودك في الشركه البروجكت ستراكشر البروجكتس هذه تبدا وتنتهي تبدا وتنتهي فتخلص من البروجكت الاول انتهى خلاص تخش على البروجكت الثاني تخلص منه تروح للبروجكت الثالث فبالتالي انت مالك اداره معينه حترجع لها في الاخير it's all about you are working from project to project jumping from one you know event to another so again one of the more modern ways of how things are structured in organizations a matrix structure and a project structure okay so this is what we mean by a matrix organization you have those big functions at the top R and D research and development marketing customer service HR and so on and then you also have products one two and three or they could be projects ففي تيم في تقاطع ما بين كل فانكشن وكل برودكت في ناس جايه من الار ان دي شغاله على برودكت 1 ناس شغاله جايه من الماركتينج برضه شغاله على البرودكت 1 and so on so this is a matrix organization okay this is when everything is centered around your products your uh, projects and the things that make uh, make you money basically the most essential things in your organization so you assign teams from each and every function and this is why you have two managers if you are one who works in the CS group for product 2 you are one who works in the customer service group for product 2 there is one who is called the manager of customer service and there is one who is called the manager of the company for product 2 so you have two managers واحد ترجع له في اي شيء يخص الكاستمر سيرفيس واحد ترجع له في اي شيء يخص البرودكت 2 فبيسكلي ايفن يور بيرفورمانس از جوينج تو بي ايفالويتد باي تو مانجر سو ذي شير ذات اثوريتي ذاتس ذا هول ذاتس ذا مين ذس ديستينغويشينج فاكتور ان ماتريكس اورجانيزيشنز از ذات مانجرز شير اثوريتي Another modern approach to organizational design is what is known today as the boundaryless organization. It's an organization without boundaries. It has no, uh, it has no limitations basically. Nothing that confines this organization to vertical, horizontal boundaries. It doesn't have a predefined structure. Uh, this is probably one of the um, ideas of Jack Welsh one of the uh, uh, leading experts in the field of management and the former CEO of General Electric. He was, highly, he was always emphasizing that you know, adaptability and flexibility are the most essential factors to an organization's success. Why? Because this is the nature of today's business. Everything is constantly changing and you have to have a structure that can respond quickly to that change. So it's kind of an odd concept. So if there are no boundaries, so how is work structured? How is everything done in an organization? So it basically, the basic idea is that it has no rigid structure. So it encourages the free, the free flow of information. It, 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 it does not have, you know, much division of labor in terms of that you know each and everyone has a distinct role that they cannot go beyond that you know everything is confined to certain uh, job descriptions no everything is loose everything not loose in a negative way but loose in terms that it flows freely from one uh, side to another from one part to another and this is how things are done much faster in, in such an organization. Um, typically, people and you know, employees of this organization are uh, tech savvy, meaning that um, they are people who know technology and they can use modern tools in order to uh, you know, do their jobs and uh, uh, become more efficient. Another concept is what is known as the virtual organization, al-iftiradiyya, the term virtual, is, it's, it's, it's about, you know, people working remotely. This is what is currently happening nowadays with all this, uh, you know, pandemic of the coronavirus. Everything is, you know, we have virtual meetings, we have virtual lectures, we have virtual classes. Iftiradiyya, we are not together in the same location, 
but we use technology to communicate in real time. So a virtual organization is one that consists of a small number of core full-time employees and the majority of the work and uh, lots of other you know jobs are being done by outsiders outsiders who do not have to come to the workplace itself they do, not, they do not have to be to physically be in the location and in the premises of the organization but they can do everything from home uh, using you know a computer and an internet access so um, this has happened I have seen this happen in lots of organizations um, sometimes it's all about you know giving your employees the flexibility and sometimes it's you in an organization you being flexible by not limiting yourself only to people who can be here انا اقدر استفيد من يعني المواهب حقت الاشخاص اللي مو شرط انه يكونوا موجودين عندي في الجبال اذا انا شاركتي او فرعي في الجبال انا ممكن استفيد من خبرات الناس اللي موجودين في كل مكان في العالم because we can do things virtually, we can do things online. And here we have more design options. So a task force or an ad hoc committee. So this is basically a temporary team that is formed for the sole purpose of solving a certain problem in a, a, a short term um, time frame so um, how is that different from cross-functional teams the, di the main difference here is the is the temporary uh, uh, the temporary factor uh, so ad hoc teams or task forces are temporary meaning that the minute their job is done they disband خلاص no more لجنة مؤقتة يتم تشكيلها أو فريق عمل معين يتم تشكيله يشتغل على تاسك معين على مشروع معين لفترة قصيرة مجرد أنه انتهى المشروع هذا خلاص يتم حل هذه اللجنة So that's your task force or your ad hoc committee uh, A different concept is what is called open innovation so this is when you basically open up the search for new ideas beyond the organization's boundaries. It's all about information. So in order to be more innovative, you have to have some sort of way to send and receive information from any person who could be a source of the new best thing, of this new idea of how things could be, you know, how things could change the face of the business. So when you adopt this philosophy of open innovation, you allow uh, information to travel, you know, outside and inside the organization. You are looking for ideas from everywhere. You are looking, you are, you are considering every certain, every individual within your organization and outside the organization a potential source of a good innovative idea that you could benefit in your business so in order for that to happen you have to have you know a, a, a structure that is supportive of that in a, in a highly rigid structure of course this is not going to work uh, in a highly rigid structure you are not even accepting information to travel from you know, one level to another. Nahik Anha it travels from uh, uh, outside the organization. So this philosophy or concept of open innovation, it's all about, you know, sending and receiving information, allowing information to come in your organization and even to travel outside of your organization. The whole idea here is that you want you do not want to neglect anything. You, you, you consider everyone a potential source of the next innovative idea. Again, the, we can never say that, yes, open innovation is the best philosophy, the best approach to follow. Everything has its own advantages, disadvantages, pros and cons, benefits and drawbacks. So some of the benefits of open innovation is that it gives customers a voice. You are considering your customers 
a source of information. They can benefit you. You are asking your customers and everyone outside the organization even, what can we do differently? What can we do to make things better? But the, the, the negative side is that it, it poses high demands of managing the process. صعب جدا انه انت الان كيف راح تدير العمليه هذه كلها؟ كيف راح تصمم الاستبيانات هذه؟ وكيف حتستفيد منها؟ مين الاشخاص اللي حيكونون مسؤولين عنها؟ كيف تحول الافكار الخام هذه الى actual things that can benefit your organization. So it's a lot to manage and to process. Uh, another benefit is that it allows organizations to respond to complex problems. Of course, because you can, you have, this is the whole benefit and, and you know, idea behind diversity. التنوع, التنوع في مصادر الأفكار يعطيك richness, يعطيك يعني قوة وغنى because you have lots of different opinions from lots of different people. So it, by having that, you can respond to different situations because you have multiple points of views from multiple people from multiple backgrounds. However, a drawback of this is that it requires and it needs extensive support. Again, the process is going to be overwhelming. How are you going to collect this feedback? How are you going to transform it into actual bits and pieces of things that you can implement in your organization? So this nice exhibit shows a comparison or actually shows an evaluation of what is good about open innovation and what is not so good about innovation, open innovation. And since we talked about the idea of uh, virtual organizations, we also have to mention telecommuting. And telecommuting is basically the arrangement, the work arrangement of working from home. As long as you have a computer and internet access, then you are good to go. بعض الوظائف طبيعتها تسمح إنه مو لازم الشخص يكون موجود physically في في مكتبه في الشركة. كثير من الوظائف المكتبية ممكن إنه الشخص يعمل عن بعد telecommuting. And this is what is going on nowadays with this, you know, pandemic of the coronavirus. اكتشفنا إنه في كثير من الوظائف ممكن إنه هي تحول إلى عمل عن بعد. في again فيها advantages and disadvantages. Some of the advantages is that it it gives the employees the freedom and the flexibility of work life balance. بعض ال بعض الناس ممكن هو يعيش في منطقة ما حصل وظيفة في منطقة هذه لكن هو ممكن يعمل عن بعد حتى لو كان فرع الشركة في أي مكان آخر في العالم. بعض ال الأمهات مثلا يحتاجون إنهم هم يكونون موجودين مع أطفالهم. بعض الناس عندهم التزامات أسرية معينة. So telecommuting can be a good option for some groups of employees. Uh, لازم نعرف إنه مو كل الوظائف ممكن إن هي تحول للعمل عن بعد. Uh, still, when you work from home, you lack you lack that you know face-to-face -face interaction with your supervisor, with your colleagues. So you do lose. Some of that, uh, you know, some of those benefits of working physically with a team. Uh, not to mention that there are some technical difficulties. أحيانا تكون الاتصال بالإنترنت يسبب يعني يكون في ضعف يسبب مشكلة في التواصل. هذا الأمر ما راح يكون موجود إذا كان face to face. So this is something again to consider in your modern organization. Maybe you know some jobs can be done. Uh, by using this option telecommuting, uh, maybe you could allow your employees to have that option if they want to, and you know it 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 is one option that is available to managers. Uh, some managers they do not prefer that because they would say I cannot really supervise my employees this way. Some managers they have no problem because they have set clear goals for their employees, so regardless of whether or not they are working in the physical location of the company's branch, they, it's for them, it's all about delivering results. So telecommuting is one option that can be considered.
Okay, other types of work arrangements include the compressed work week, flex time, or job sharing. واحدة من يعني العديد من البدائل كذلك موجودة غير العمل عن بعد اللي ممكن توفرها للموظفين من ضمنها أسبوع العمل المضغوط compressed work week. So basically, this is when employees work longer hours per day but fewer days per week. أتذكر مثلا في مطعم ماكدونالدز وفي أغلب المطاعم الوجبات السريعة يعرضون عليك كموظف تشتغل في المطبخ أو ككاشير يعرضون عليك خيارين يقول لك تبغى تشتغل ثمانية ساعات في اليوم وتأخذ يوم واحد راحة في الأسبوع ولا تبغى تشتغل عشر ساعات في اليوم وتأخذ يومين راحة في الأسبوع فبالتالي في الترتيب الأول لما اشتغلت ثمانية ساعات عندك ستة أيام عمل في الأسبوع ثمانية ساعات في اليوم ستة أيام عمل في الأسبوع يوم راحة واحد الترتيب الثاني عشر ساعات في اليوم خمسة أيام عمل فقط ويومين راحة فهنا إيش أنت ضغط أسبوع العمل اشتغلت ساعات زيادة في اليوم مقابل أنه أنا تصير عدد أيام العمل في الأسبوع أقل وبالتالي يصير عندي عدد أيام أوف أكثر So that's your compressed work week. In the flex time arrangement, uh, this is a little different because you give your employees a target. So I want you to give me 40 hours of work per week. I don't care how many hours you work per day. So as long as you give me 40 hours of work per week. So what, what happens is this. Uh, يجي الشخص يقول لك أنا حشتغل اليوم خمسة ساعات فقط بكرة حشتغل عشرة ساعات اليوم اللي بعده حشتغل أربع ساعات أنا ما يهمني كشركة كم ساعة تشتغل في اليوم as long as أنت تعطيني أربعين ساعة عمل في الأسبوع طبعا هذا دائما يكون فيها دقة كرت أو يكون فيها تسجيل دخول أو توقيع أو whatever some sort of way in order to really measure and you know evaluate how many hours per week uh, did you log in uh, again ما ينفع هذه الترتيبات مو صالحة لكل أنواع الوظائف في وظائف معينة ما يصلح معها هذا الترتيب نحتاجك أنه أنت تكون موجود عدد ساعات معين في اليوم uh, بعض وظائف البنوك مثلا uh, إلى آخره uh, Another arrangement is what is called job sharing, and that is the practice of having two or more people split a full-time job. So you are basically doing half a job. هذه تحصل نعم تحصل. أنا ما أقدر أشتغل ثمانية ساعات في اليوم. زميلي الآخر شخص آخر كذلك نفس وضعي ما يقدر يشتغل ثمانية ساعات في اليوم. طيب إحنا نقول لهم إحنا حنشتغل نصف وظيفة. إحنا الاثنين نسوي وظيفة كاملة فكل واحد فينا حيسوي نصف وظيفة وأعطونا نصف الراتب هذا الترتيب يناسبني أنا ويناسب ظروفي الخاصة الأسرية or whatever أنا طالب مثلا أو غيره فنقول لهم نسوي job sharing آه هذا كذلك كان واحد من الخيارات اللي عرض على كثير من الموظفين آه وقت الأزمة الاقتصادية الكبيرة اللي حصلت في 2008 قالوا عندكم خيارين إما أنه إحنا نفصلكم بالكامل لأنه إحنا ما نقدر نتحمل رواتبكم وبالتالي أنتم ما يصير عندكم دخل أو نخلي كل اثنين يشتركون في وظيفة وندفع لكم نصف الراتب فبالتالي يصير عندكم على الأقل نوع من أنو يعني من مصادر الدخل بدل ما تخسرون مصدر دخلكم بالكامل وكثير من الموظفين اختاروا الخيار هذا they opted for this option and uh, when things got back on track, then, you know, the next couple of years, everything went back to normal and, you know, life went on. So these are certain arrangements that you can offer your employees that could allow you to, you know, benefit from the skills and the talents of such individuals who have, you know, special circumstances. Again, this is not applicable to all kinds of jobs. You have to be really... Uh, uh, you know, thoughtful about which types of jobs can these arrangements uh, apply to. And the last thing we will discuss on our chapter this week is what is called the contingent workforce. So contingent, as we have seen before, the contingency approach to management. So everything is dependent upon 
the situation. So just think about it this way. Contingent means temporary. So a contingent worker is someone who is here on a temporary basis, someone who is a freelancer or a contract worker. So we have them here only for a certain period of time. Once their services are no longer required, then we tell them goodbye. So this, this is an arrangement that works sometimes for certain people. Uh, they do not want to work, they do not, they do not want to have a full-time job and work you know, for longer years. They just want you know, to work from, from one project to another. Um, and it, it also works for organizations. Um, so it is an arrangement that could work for both organizations and certain you know, uh, employees. Again, it has to do with your requirements. So you have to think about, uh, do I need a full-time employee? Do I need someone to work here permanently? Or do I just need someone to offer me certain uh, services and then I can just tell them goodbye? So that's a, that's a contingent worker or a freelancer, someone who is not bounded by a permanent contract. They just come, offer you some services, and then they leave. And you pay them based on that service. So that was our chapter, one of the longest and most detailed chapters in our syllabus. But it's, again, one of the most important ones because it talks about the design of organizations. And uh, without a, uh, a design that is supportive of your strategy, without a design that is supportive of how things are done in order to grow your business, of course, things will not be as successful. So thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you on the next chapter.